So I'm calling the talk the IGNY Me. That's actually the title of my blog. Um, and my stamp collecting sort of interrelates to my blog these days. So I can't think of one really without the other. Um, you can later on uh, either look at the slideshow with the link there, and maybe Paul will be able to forward that on separately. Um, it's kind of a weird thing to jot down. And my blog, there's the link for the blog, or I think if you just Google the IGY and me, uh, you should probably be able to find the blog uh, easily enough. Okay, here's a little bit of an outline of what I'm gonna talk about, uh, uh, how I started collecting stamps, um, how I got to do my blog, what was the IGY, uh, a little bit about the stamp itself and its designer, Irvine Metzl, um, some checklists on the stamp, um, a little more information about the stamp itself and some covers, uh, a little one page exhibit I did on it, um, and uh, how I buy stamps, um, and a couple of albums to show you, and actually a musical album at the end that I can mention as well. So this gives a little bit of my life history, <laughs> telling you how I got to where I am with both the stamps and the blog. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I collected stamps in a very childlike way. Uh, my parents were from Europe, so we had relatives abroad, and uh, my mother, a little later on, went to work for Kiplinger Press, Press and handled lots of mail from different countries. So that was mostly how I got my stamps. I bought some uh, at the post office, of course, but uh, it, was, it was childlike as many of us started out. Um, the IGY happened when I was seven and eight years old in 1957 and 1958. I actually wasn't that aware of it at the time, but uh, there was a spirit of science education which followed the launching of Sputnik and everything that happened during the IGY. So I grew up in the Washington DC area and one television show we watched on the three channels we had available uh, in school was Time for Science. Later on, when I got to college, I studied physics. And when I went to graduate school, I studied geophysics. In between, I actually worked for a satellite company, Fairchild Space and Electronics for a couple of years. And after I finished grad school, I came here to Lancaster and I taught at f and for 33 years. And all of that was in, in geophysics. About 20 years ago, I kind of got the urge that I wanted to start collecting something. I don't know where that came from exactly, um, but I ended up deciding to collect stamps and other things related to the IGY. And partly I was anticipating the 50th anniversary of the IGY that was coming up in 2007. And actually during the, the, the semi-centennial, I did give a talk at a professional meeting about my collection and another talk in my academic department about it. Um, during COVID, you know, we all needed some extra things to do. So I started a blog about the IGY and that also involved my stamp collection. And so I'll talk a little bit more about those things in a minute. Um, now, I have a couple of videos that I've put into the presentation. I think I'm going to skip them because they seem to, uh, I tested this out and they seem to be a little choppy. Uh, but if you go back and, and look at this file later on, you can play the videos uh, yourself. But uh, I've done in the past two blogs for groups that I was working with. Uh, one was called The Shaking Earth. Uh, FNM was in a consortium with Lamont Doherty um, Cooperative Seismographic Network. And I wrote a blog that was related to earthquakes for a couple of years. And another group I was involved in, the Society for Archaeological Sciences, uh, what used to be is the blog is now actually the online bulletin. And I started that. And for those, I did one or two blogs a week. Um, for those, those two venues. Um, when I was uh, collecting, doing my IGY collecting, I, I didn't really think I would get into to stamp exhibiting. Um, and so far I really haven't, but I had some desire to share what I was doing uh, with other people. And a couple of years ago, my wife and I were watching the movie uh, Julie and Julia 
Uh, it's about Julia Child, the chef, and Julie Powell, uh, a young woman who decided she was going to cook every recipe in Julia Child's Mastering the Art of French Cooking in a year. And she started blogging about it. And at some point in, in the movie, she says, I can do a blog. And it really did strike me at that point that I could do a blog too about the IGY. It would be a good way to share my collection, um, to think about it a little bit more, uh, to talk about the, the stamps, the science, other materials, and a little bit about me personally and incorporate all in that blog. After all, blogs are just whatever we wanna say, really. And uh, so about a year and a half ago, I started the blog. And when I think about blogging, I think about how often I try to write uh, a blog or two a week. Um, the length of them, about 500 words per post, sort of readable. Uh, I usually have a lot of links to refer you to additional material about the various topics I discuss. I like to incorporate uh, a couple of pictures in each uh, post, which often are stamps or covers. I go off on personal tangents and I think that's okay. Um, and so you can, you can decide yourself if you have a look at the blog. Um, currently, the model I'm using for the blog is I'm following articles that were published in the IGY bulletins. Uh, these were short reports on IGY goings on. Uh, there's 96 issues of them. They're about 16 pages each. And I've started off trying to write a brief summary of each article. Uh, so I just started last July to celebrate the beginning of the IGY on July 1st. And every month I'm trying to cover one month worth of articles in the IGY bulletin. So um, this will take me uh, eight years and we'll see if I uh, maintain the energy and desire to do it. But that's currently how I'm organizing uh, the blog. Um, the IGY lasted actually for 18 months because they wanted to be sure to include the solar maximum that was uh, happening during that period of time. Um, 67 countries uh, were involved uh, with perhaps about 10,000 scientists um, and 2,000 global research stations where all kinds of things were measured. Um, there was an estimate of the expense of the IGY, which if translated in today's dollars would be about $20 billion. So it was a big endeavor. It was actually the third polar year after the first one that occurred in 1882 and the second one in 1932, uh, but it got more comprehensive. So they renamed it the IGY. And there's since been a fourth polar year that occurred in 2007. Now I have a couple of quotes from two different um, uh, sources. Uh, one, the first one was written by Lloyd Bertner, a geophysicist and an important person during the IGY. And the second one was from a history of science uh, article. Uh, but both of them are pretty similar. I, I've highlighted in red, I think the most important points. Uh, it was an ambitious program considered to be uh, highly successful uh, one of the most uh, uh, important and successful international cooperations ever. Uh, and the idea was to observe the earth many different ways and for some measurements to measure simultaneously uh, across much of the earth's surface. Um, and uh, like I said, uh, most people consider this a, an amazingly successful endeavor. Now I have a video uh, with President Eisenhower uh, initiating uh, the uh, beginning of the IGY. But again, I think I'll skip over playing that. He basically just says what the text on this slide says as well. He was looking forward to a, a, a very successful 18 months. And if you especially consider that this uh, cooperative endeavor was happening in the middle of the Cold War, uh, it, it's really uh, uh, impressive uh, how successful it turned out to be. Rob, yes. I, have, I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm totally unfamiliar with this area of science. What is a solar maximum? Okay, so uh, 
the sun goes through what's called a solar cycle and it can be measured in different ways, but maybe the most, uh, it can be measured by sunspot uh, activity. Uh, so there's an, an 11 year cycle that cycles through uh, time when you have solar minimum, fewer sunspots and solar maximum when you have higher sunspots. And uh, that correlates with other indicators of, of solar activity as well. And, and also uh, what is a polar year? So the polar in this case, meaning North Pole and South Pole, Arctic and Antarctic studies. Yeah, uh, but what is the significance of those particular years being designated as polar years? So again, those were, um, they were, uh, uh, especially in 1882, Carl Weiprecht was kind of the moving force and he just encouraged a lot of different countries to do cooperative endeavors to make measurements at the North and the South Pole. And after 25 years, they decided to give this another go. Uh, the first one had been successful, but uh, there was more to do. And then after 50 years, they went for a third one. And after another 25 years, they went for a fourth one. So it was just attempts to learn more about our polar regions, which even up until the IGY had been not very well explored and certainly not studied scientifically very much. Many thanks. So these were uh, 14 uh, areas that were specifically indicated as areas of study for the IGY. And um, I don't need, to, I think, to read through all of them, but they included studies on the, on the earth, like glaciology, which in this case also means the North and South Poles, the oceans, more the solid earth with earthquakes and seismology and gravity studies, but also atmospheric, uh, studies in various ways, including the planned launching of satellites and rockets um, by both the United States and the Soviet Union. And also the study of my own sort of area of expertise is the Earth's magnetic field. The ones here in red, a little bit later in the talk, I'm gonna show some covers and I decided to choose covers to illustrate these three areas, which were probably the most important areas of discovery during the IGY. So I'll show a few co covers on those a little bit later on. Um, but let's start with the stamp. So this is my uh, childhood stamp uh, album. And I did have the IGY stamp issued in 1958. Um, I didn't really know anything about the IGY at the time, but there it was. So here again, I, I show the stamp itself, and I, I agree with Paul, it's a, it's a nice design. There's both some scientific content and some humanistic content, and we'll look at both of those in the next couple of slides. Uh, everything I'm going to show today pretty much is the things I own from my collection, whether they be the stamps or the covers or the few books that I'll show. Um, here's the listing for and the Scott catalog of the stamp. Um, and I'll talk about some of these things in a little bit. Uh, this just happens to be the day after my birthday. So I guess when I was eight years old, uh, I could have gone to the post office the next day and, and bought the IGY stamp. So just a couple of other things about the stamp. Um, this was actually the fourth stamp that was uh, printed using the Diori Press. So this allowed for the simultaneous uh, application of a couple of different colors. So the first three, the Old Glory stamp, the Magsaysay -Say stamp, and the Whoop and Crane stamps preceded it, but it was pretty early on to, to show some nice uh, colorful effects. It was one of the last uh, stamps to, to have a three cent postage for kind of a first class mail. Uh, which hadn't changed the rate since 1932, uh, but a month after the stamp was issued, uh, went up to, to four cents. And as I said, the stamp just happened to come out, come, come, come out right, uh, right after my birthday. So of course you can find information about the stamp in the usual places, uh, the postal bulletin, had a column on it. 
And uh, so did the uh, Bureau Specialist. Today, that's the United States Specialist by the U.S. Uh, Stamp Society, but uh, it had another name back then. And in the Bureau Specialist, um, there were pictures of different models for the stamps, which I, I don't kind of own any of these or essays or anything like that. Um, but here's the uh, design that was promoted by Irvine Metzl, the designer of the stamp. Excuse me. There were four other uh, models of this, uh, four other models of the stamp, designs for the stamp. Uh, in the end, the stamp was modeled by Charles Chickering. I've read a little bit about him, and I guess he's quite renowned, although I don't I haven't read as much about him as I have by Metzl, who I'll talk about in, in a couple of slides coming up. Um, the stamp was originally planned to be issued at the end of 1958. So you see the different four cent denominations here, but when it was actually issued, uh, first class postage was still three cents. So that's the stamp that we ended up with. Okay, so uh, this is a, a nice little video, but I, again, I think I'll, I'll save it. It's, it's probably uh, gonna be too choppy, but you can certainly look at it uh, if you wish to later on. But I wanted to think a little bit about what was happening here on the solar surface. And I think we tend to reflexively say these are solar flares, which are similar to, but different from solar prominences. So solar flares tend to be a little more linear as they shoot out from the sun's surface. Uh, the prominences, like you see here, are uh, loops of plasma. And just for scale, uh, the Earth would kind of fit inside uh, about this big of a space on one of these solar prominences. Um, so um, I think that Metzl did a fairly nice job of capturing solar activity, which was one of the foci of studies during the IGY in an attractive way. But in terms of the humanities aspect, uh, he's got the two hands here. And as you might have realized, uh, that comes from the Michelangelo fresco, uh, the creation of Adam. Uh, so creation of Adam uh, is in the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican. So here's the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel uh, with a number of frescoes, uh, stories from the Bible. And right in here, you can't really make that out too well, but this is the uh, creation of Adam. Uh, the... Um, Size of that is about 130 feet by 40 feet. And it sort of represents, I think, the uh, God, whether you want to use lower case G or uppercase G, uh, as a source of knowledge or wisdom for people, mankind. And uh, so I think if you think about the stamp, you've got the science and mm, it's the urge of people to gain knowledge about the, the world and the universe they live in, whether their attitude is sort of divine or scientific, uh, but that desire to know and to understand. Uh, the, this, of course, was painted in 1510, plus or minus a couple of years, uh, is when Michelangelo was doing this work. Uh, first day of issue, I have a copy of the, of the program for the ceremony. Uh, this was done as part of uh, Compex. Uh, here's a cover from Compex. I guess it took place in the Salle Hotel in Chicago for this first day of issue cover. And here's a postcard also uh, um, canceled on, on the first day of issue uh, showing uh, downtown uh, Chicago. So the uh, participants uh, at the ceremony included Arthur Summerfield, who was Postmaster General, um, Elroy 
Walter, who was the special assistant to the Postmaster General, and Franklin Bruns, Jr., director of the Division of Philately. So I'm sure many of you know those names uh, from that era of, uh, of Philately. So Irvine Metzl, uh, he lived from 1899 to 1963. He was an American graphic artist and il illustrator, and he was best known for his work on posters and on postage stamps. I uh, had a very good reputation in those areas. So in this slide, I have the first day cover from uh, the IGY uh, signed by Metzl. Uh, he wrote this book shown here called The Poster. And uh, it, uh, in the book, he spends a lot of time discussing his ideas of what makes for good design of a poster. And in other writings, he talked about stamps as being miniature posters uh, for conveying information, imagery, and, and to provide pleasure in the viewing of them. Um, this quote here, is from not, not from Metzl himself, but from Fairfax Cohn, an advertising executive who wrote the introduction to uh, this book, The Poster. So I assume Metzl might have been sympathetic to the sentiment. It's rather harsh and you may or may not agree with it, but uh, you can read it. He says that one of the sorriest continuing exhi exhibitions of Poster art in America today is made up of the parade of bad drawings and impossible ideas that decorate US postage stamps. Uh, so uh, Metzl, I don't think, had a, had a good impression of postage stamps up till that time, but certainly Fairfax Cohn did not either. Uh, Metzl also wrote three articles in the late 50s, early 60s about um, stamps, United States stamps, and what he considered to be good design practices, and how stamps could be done better. Uh, so he's not, his words aren't as harsh as uh, the ones that Cohn used, but I think uh, he, he had similar beliefs that uh, stamps could be done better. So Metzl was a charter member of the Citizen Stamp Advisory Committee, which was established in 1957 to give advice to the Postmaster General on the selection of uh, stamp designs and stamp topics. Uh, so on that committee, there were three artists, three philatelists, an official of the United States Information Service, we'll come back to that in a bit, and representatives of the Post Office Department and the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. So the, the artists started to have a real say in uh, how stamps should look. And so Metzl was an important person in crafting uh, stamp design starting in the late 1950s. Um, I decided to show um, all 10 uh, stamps he designed um, that were uh, between 1957 and I think 1960. Um, the shipbuilding was the first one he was involved in. And uh, if you looked at the latest issue of the American Philatelist, um, there was an article by Charles Posner in his series on stamps of the 50s. Uh, and he talks about the fact that the main designer of the stamp was actually Marguerite Thompson Zorath. And I coincidentally happened to know her grandson who lives here in Lancaster and is the husband of a, of a former colleague of mine. Um, Metzl was often given the credit for designing of the stamp, I guess being a man in what was at that time mostly a man's world. Uh, Zorak was actually only the second woman to have designed a stamp uh, after Elaine Rob Rawlinson, who designed the one cent George Washington stamp in the 1938 presidential series. Uh, Metzl also designed all four Lincoln sesquicentennial stamps. So here was the first one in 1958. And there were three more to come in 1959. Uh, he also designed the stamp, the first United States stamp for a satellite, which was not for the first satellite, Coming back to that, uh, but it was for Echo 
one, which was a communication satellite that was launched in 1960. So I have a few different checklists on IGY stamps. I think this was the oldest one uh, from the American Topical Association uh, from 1958. This is 15 pages. I only have a Xerox copy of it, um, but this is on uh, stamps and uh, other, other markings on the stamps. Um, this is one of the kind of odd things I found on eBay once upon a time, but it was a German uh, language catalog uh, that focused on IGY stamps. And these are two checklists done by very prolific uh, authors, uh, Gary Toth and Don Hilger. Uh, they've done lots of articles and checklists on things related to the space environment and weather and climate. So they did a more recent and comprehensive checklist here on the left uh, for the American Topical Association. And they also have great compilations of their catalogs and checklists uh, online. And, and here is the link for their IGY uh, checklist online. So they list actually 73 items uh, on this list um, for stamps of the IGY. I know they've missed at least, I haven't checked this super carefully. Uh, they don't list a Norway stamp and I have one of those. So uh, we all miss things and they miss at least that one, if nothing else. Um, through the help of uh, Scott Tiffany at the APS library, I got a copy from the Malone catalogs on covers having to do with the IGY US covers. And the catalog lists 31 covers. I'm still missing seven of those, but I do have uh, 200 covers on the IGY and related topics. And the blog sometimes gets me into the related topics. And sometimes if I don't have a cover of a topic that my blog leads me to, uh, I'll go out and buy it. So I can try to only show um, philatelic items in my blog that I either own or have just bought. <laughs> There's a few pretty good articles that have been done on IGY stamps and covers. So again, this uh, one in the top left, is by Hilger and Toff, who I mentioned before. Um, you've got to watch out how to spell their names because Hilger has two L's and Gary Toff has two R's. Uh, but they had this article in Astrophile in 2007, which was the 50th anniversary of the IGY. Um, there was also uh, this article by uh, Bob Greenwald, who was a bit of a mentor to me as I was getting more involved in my IGY collection. So uh, this was in the American Philatelist in 2007, that same semi-centennial year, anniversary of the IGY. And uh, not so long ago, uh, there was an article by Michael uh, Urzon. I, I couldn't, I've, I've been in contact with these gentlemen here and with uh, Bob, I've been unable to contact or even find an email or anything for, for, for Burzon. But all these articles are certainly uh, worth looking at. There was also a 2007 article by Jim Reichman in Astrophile, which was on IGY stamps issued by the Soviet Union. And there were, there were quite a few of those with their launches of Sputnik 1, 2, and 3. Uh, I've been lucky to have the assistance of uh, uh, Lucy Tissione, who is a neighbor. She's a student at McCaskey High School. So she comes over for a couple of hours every week and helps me kind of catalog some things, get them in my spreadsheets, and also to do some scanning. Uh, so this is where I'm sitting right now. Uh, I have uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I bought a um, an Epson scanner. It's a Perfection V600 photo scanner, which I found to be very adequate for scanning my materials. 
And this is actually one of uh, six very nice IGY posters. This is an original that were published by the National Academy of Sciences in the 1950s. And you can, um, you can find those and download copies of those uh, through this link that's on the page here. So um, I guess I decided just yesterday to kind of say, take my list of all my IGY stamps and just see what countries are represented. So I actually have IGY stamps from 32 countries and dependencies. Uh, one, because the IGY involved Antarctica, everybody that had a claim on Antarctica, you know, kind of issued a stamp. So you've got stamps from the Ross dependency uh, on Antarctica, which is sort of part of New Zealand. We've got the British Antarctic Territory, the Falkland Islands, South Georgia. Um, so some of these countries, I think, were more active in the IGY research than others, but for one reason or another, uh, they all issued stamps on the IGY. So these are 32 countries out of the 67 that participated in the IGY that issued stamps. So I'm just gonna take you on a very quick tour of all the IGY stamps in my collection. Now, these include stamps that have found their way into my blog, which are not really IGY stamps, but were tangentially related enough that I wanted to say something about them in my blog. So you can see kind of the imagery you'd expect. Uh, there's uh, a lot of Antarctic imagery. There are maps that show the claims that different countries had on slices of the Antarctic. Some famous explorers like Douglas Mawson from Australia. Um, of course, satellite uh, stamps. This Bulgarian stamp is Sputnik uh, 2, I think. Um, some scientists who um, invented geophysical instruments in the stamp from uh, Colombia. Um, China actually was not a uh, participant in the IGY uh, because there was a controversy uh, with Taiwan being represented in the IGY. So uh, mainland China did actually not uh, participate officially, but they did issue these stamps to commemorate the Sputnik launches. Um, and again, here you see other stamps with, uh, I like the ones actually that show scientific instruments rather than always showing the uh, satellites and the rockets and the, uh, and the polar views that some of the other stamps show. Again, another bunch, similar, similar themes. It's interesting to see some of the colorful sets that were released by Haiti and uh, Indonesia's coming up, or I guess uh, uh, yeah, on the next page. So uh, there were some sets of multiple stamps uh, that some countries released. Here are those Indonesian stamps. Uh, North Korea, as well as East Germany had IGY stamps, although neither South Korea nor West Germany did. Uh, and here, then you see uh, a number of the Soviet stamps on different aspects uh, of the IGY. And finally, this is sort of the tail end of the file. So I get into some of the related stamps that are not strictly IGY stamps, uh, but uh, uh, these were the only stamps uh, that I could find uh, that explicitly honored Explorer 3, uh, which is a satellite I'll mention again in a minute. Uh, these come, came from um, Antigua and, and Barbados. Um, and some of these other stamps I've used in different ways in the blog to make points about some different things, although they're not really IGY stamps. So I'm gonna show a few covers and uh, I'm gonna do that by picking out these three main accomplishments of the IGY that I mentioned before. Uh, so 
I think the, the accomplishment of the IGY that probably resonates with most people are the first uh, artificial satellites. And as I said before, those were planned uh, to happen during the IGY. And so uh, it was certainly expected that both the United States and the Soviet Union would launch satellites during the IGY. So although I guess the public tended to be surprised and alarmed when Sputnik 1 uh, was the first to be successfully launched, um, there was probably a 50-50 chance of whether the Soviet Union or the United States would be uh, first to, to launch a satellite. But the Soviets made it with Sputnik 1, and they also uh, followed that up with Sputnik 2 before the United States uh, had its first successful launch with Explorer 1, Vanguard 1, and then Explorer 3. So the United States didn't have a stamp to honor uh, any of these initial satellite launches. I mentioned before the first US stamp on a satellite was for the Echo-1 communication satellite in 1960. Uh, so some months back, uh, I saw the online presentation. I think that's through the American Metallic Society by Martin Motoresi. He gave a very interesting presentation on the role of stamps in US foreign relations. And he and I had some contact later on, and he directed me to this document, which I found fascinating. It also confirmed the hypothesis I had about why there was no uh, Explorer 1 US stamp until 1999. And that's because, well, we weren't first to be successful with the satellite. And so if we'd had a stamp on that, it would have more or less admitted, well, we're number two, and they didn't want that wasn't that wasn't to be done. Um, so these are minutes that Mateen directed me to that you can you can find in, in the in the State Department archives. The document from the Operations Coordinating Board, um, and it's signed. Oh, I clipped off the signature here. It's actually signed by Alan Dulles who was director of the CIA at the time. Uh, this was a, a committee of the, of the executive branch of government that was created by Eisenhower in 1953 that was tasked with oversight of United States covert operations. And so here is actually the statement that um, um, it was considered unwise uh, to uh, issue a commemorative stamp in honor of the launch of Explorer 1 because it would suggest the disparity we had with the Soviet Union who beat us into space. Uh, so I found it kind of fascinating that, uh, I mean, we all know that stamps, among the things they do, can be sources of, of propaganda. And uh, I think it was considered that a Explorer 01 stamp would be uh, negative propaganda. Um, but finally, in 1999, as part of the um, uh, Stamps of the Century series on the sheet for the 1950s, uh, we see a stamp for Explorer 1. So it finally got its uh, day in court, so to speak. Um, this is the oldest cover that I own uh, that specifically uh, uh, features Explorer 1 here in the cache. Uh, this was from the Smithsonian's Milestones of Flight series, the third one in that series. Uh, and it's still 15th anniversary of Explorer 1. There are older covers. Some of those are quite expensive, but um, so I don't own them yet. So um, along with the satellite launches into space, um, one of the very significant discoveries uh, of the IGY and the use of those satellites was the discovery of the Van Allen radiation belts. So the Van Allen radiation belts are two zones um, where charged particles are trapped by the Earth's magnetic field. And these were discovered with Explorer 1, our first successful satellite, which had a Geiger counter on board uh, and confirmed with further, further measurements uh, that were on Explorer 3. Um, so uh, just to give you a scale of what we're looking at, this is sort of the, the atmosphere over here. 
the weather in the troposphere. We have our ozone layer in the stratosphere. Uh, we have meteors showing up here in the mesosphere. Uh, up here is the ionosphere, which is another area where we get charged particles trapped, but of a different nature. Uh, and those charged particles are related to the aurora. Um, the Kármán line at 100 kilometers or 60 miles up is designated as the boundary to outer space because uh, airplanes couldn't support themselves flying that high up. So you need some kind of propulsion system to get vehicles up here. So this uh, only goes up to 120 kilometers on this figure. But here, this is actually one of Van Allen's original uh, images. And there are two zones. These would have circled around the Earth. So these are just slices through those uh, toroidal patterns of the inner belt and the outer uh, belt. Uh, these are Geiger counter numbers. And so we see that the measurements, the, the rate of counts are much higher in these belts than they are otherwise. Um, the scale here is in Earth radii. The Earth is 6,400 uh, kilometers in diameter. So uh, this is at one Earth radius above the Earth's surface. So it's another 6,000 kilometers out. And here we're at three to four. This is about 20,000 kilometers out. So these are much higher than, let's say, where the aurora occur, which is only 100 kilometers above the Earth's surface. So that's what was discovered. And uh, here's a few uh, covers that celebrate um, the explorers. Um, so finally, there's that 1999 uh, stamp and cover uh, at the turn of the century, mile, milestones of the century, celebrate the century. Uh, and then there are two, uh, a 20th anniversary and a 25th anniversary cover uh, of the launch of Explorer One. And both of these are um, postmarked Cape Canaveral. Uh, ben Allen is spelled incorrectly there. Uh, and um, here we see a, a not very great image, but I guess this is supposed to be Werner von Braun, who after the failure of the first uh, American satellite uh, Vanguard attempt, uh, he and his army group uh, took over the satellite program from the Navy group. And I'm not sure if this is supposed to be James Van Allen or William Pickering, who was the uh, director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. There are photos you can find of those three gentlemen uh, holding the model of the uh, satellite aloft. Uh, very happy that they finally got into space. And then here's a cover uh, from also the 25th anniversary. And this one is signed by uh, James Van Allen himself. So you've got to be sure the V is capitalized and the Allen is spelled uh, with an E to get his name correct. And then the third, what I'll call most significant uh, endeavors of the IGY was polar exploration, uh, most significantly in Antarctic, although there was uh, studies around the North Pole as well. Of course, the Antarctic is a continent and the Arctic is an ocean. So this shows a number of stations that were established on Antarctica uh, during the IGY. Uh, the US had these seven uh, bases at that time, and there were a number of other countries involved as well shown here. And some of these bases were shared uh, by uh, different countries. And we got a station at the South Pole uh, another one, Bird Station, is in the interior. The uh, Soviet Union uh, had a series of stations going from the coast inland. The pole of inaccessibility is the furthest point in Antarctica from the coast. And one of these is also at the South Magnetic Pole, which is not uh, coincident with the uh, South Geographic Pole. But I'm not finding that quite right now as I'm looking at it. And here's then some covers related to the polar regions. Uh, this first one, I kind of like, uh, my cursor over here. This was sent by Congressman Russell Mack 
to John Spellman in Washington. Uh, I think he used his congressional franking privileges to get this cover to the South Pole, uh, from which point it was sent onwards uh, to Mr. Spellman. Uh, it's got a not very good cachet showing, of course, penguins in Antarctica. Um, Mac, uh, Heiner's person Mac, was uh, one of the few people to die on the floor of Congress, one of six people that had an unfortunate uh, end to their uh, tenure on the Hill. Um, Spellman, I was trying to figure out who he was, and I actually had some uh, people I wrote to in, in Washington State. Um, there was a John Spellman who was a uh, uh, the governor of Washington at some point, but that was too early to be this particular John Spellman. And uh, it turns out that um, he was a librarian uh, at Grace Harbor College. And uh, I talked to a librarian there who confirmed that for me. And uh, as far as I can tell, he was not related to the governor Spellman, nor was he related to Cardinal Francis Spellman, who I guess was an avid stamp collector. It has a museum, I think, in the Boston area or someplace in New England. But, but he did live in the uh, district uh, where Russell, that Russell Mack represented. Um, this cover is from Operation Ice Skate. And uh, this came out later in 1958. So they needed to add the one cent stamp because of the, the increase in the postal rates to four cents. Um, Operation Ice Gate was a pretty kind of nifty thing in the uh, North Polar regions because it was a, uh, there was a scientific station that was established um, on, um, ice, on an ice flow. Um, that was uh, only about seven miles long and rose 50 feet above the surrounding ice pack. So a weather station was established there first, and then it was used as the base for other uh, studies in the Arctic region. Uh, I also kind of like the skater here, and I just kind of looking into that, I wondered if it was perhaps supposed to represent Carol Heiss, who I don't remember knowing about before, but she won the Women's World Figure Skating Championship for five consecutive years uh, from 1956 to 1960, which encompassed the IGY period. So only Sonia Henney ever did better than that at the uh, number, I think she won 10 uh, World Figure Skating Championships, but Carol Heiss was tied for second. Um, I like this cover here. Uh, this was... Uh, Came out in 1971. Um, is, somebody, is somebody saying something? Um, so um, these three stamps, we have the IGY stamp. Um, the Antarctic Treaty, which was signed in 1961, uh, had a lot to do with all the Antarctic studies, the cooperative studies that were done during the IGY. So the treaty was to guarantee that uh, Antarctica was to remain neutral ground where dif different countries could do research, but politically not compete with one another. Of course, President Eisenhower presided over both uh, the um, um, treaty and the IGY. So uh, the first day uh, of issue for this, uh, this date in 1971 was for the Antarctic Treaty 10-year uh, uh, anniversary and the um, cachet, of course, is related to that. And then the fourth cover I have here on the kind of polar studies uh, mini collection is uh, the IGY stamp from the third international polar year, but also these two US stamps that were issued in 2007 for the fourth international polar year. And these emphasize the Aurora Borealis and the Aurora Australis from the Southern Hemisphere. So many countries also issued stamps for the fourth international polar year. So you have the icon for the IGY and the icon logo for the uh, fourth IPY as well. Uh, 
Okay, we're getting close to the end. A couple more uh, covers to show related to two luminaries of the IGY. I have other assigned covers, but not time enough to show everything. Uh, this is Yu Oda Shaw. This is actually a press photograph that I bought of him. Uh, he lived from 1986 to 1984. He was the executive director of the U.S. National Committee for the International Geophysical Year. Uh, he was also dean of the College of Earth Sciences at the University of Arizona when I was a graduate student there. And so I had kind of been a casual acquaintance with him. We would chat a little bit in the hallway. Uh, even that time as a graduate student in geophysics, I knew basically nothing about the IGY. And I wish I had because I would have loved to talk to him about his involvement with that uh, effort. Uh, he wrote a lot of articles for public, for public consumption, for public relations for the IGY. He had a science background, but also an English background. So he was a great editor. He edited many books like this one that I own, Science and Space, with uh, Lloyd Bertner, who I mentioned before. Uh, he was really a, a charming person and a key figure uh, in the IGY. Um, the other person I'm going to show here, not a picture, but uh, I, I was able to purchase this postcard sent it's very hard to read, but the sender is J.T. Wilson. Uh, so J. Tuza Wilson, as he was commonly known, was a very prominent geophysicist, Canadian geophysicist. Um, and uh, he actually was the co-author of the very first geophysics textbook that I used in graduate school. This is it. Kind of the half the book fell out when I pulled it off my shelf yesterday, but I still have it. Um, this is one of the best uh, books about the IGY for general audiences uh, that um, Wilson uh, wrote. Um, the postcard um, has, uh, of course, a cachet on the IGY uh, postmark from the um, pole station. Uh, it's sent to the uh, Geophysical Committee uh, from uh, Argentina. And uh, I had a hard time reading the entire message here. There's too many layers of print, but it seems to say to wish you the something that starts with the C uh, of the season. And this was sent getting close to Christmas time. So I assume <laughs> some sort of seasonal hey, card. I'm on Zoom, but that's okay. I'm talking low. I have it on mute. And uh, here's the, the, the front side of the card. Uh, in my career at FNM, at some point, oh. I, I requested an article, a reprint from Wilson, and he sent me this one about plate tectonics. Uh, he had, uh, he was the originator of one of the very important ideas in plate tectonics called transform faults and boundaries. Really? To help people understand the geometry of plate tectonics on the surface of the earth. And so this article I still have in my collection. Yeah. Um, so I haven't really been into stamp exhibiting. I broke down last year and did a one-page exhibit for the American uh, Topical Society, and I decided to show IGY stamps that were actually issued during the IGY because some of the stamps came out in 1959 or 19. Would everybody please uh, mute their microphones? We're getting okay. some feedback. Thank you. That could be Lewis's. So these were all the IGY really stamps. I saw them when they moved. 57 or 1958. And I have a brief description of the theme of each stamp uh, that, uh, that I've included here. It was kind of hard to fit all these into one page, but I managed to do it. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this very cute uh, video on YouTube called Timbermania. Uh, Ernest Borgnine, who I guess was a stamp collector, uh, was the uh, was the uh, was the moderator of this video. Uh, I'm not going to play the clip here, but there's one clip which shows a family uh, and their stamp collection, and it was mentioned that the kids would call their stamps from mail that they got either at home or at work much as I did when I was a kid. Uh, so today uh, I use eBay. I've bought almost everything I have on eBay. 
and uh, as I'm sure many of you do. So uh, I have my searches on eBay that generate daily emails, which tells me about uh, IGY related materials. I have two albums, I'm getting close to the end here, two albums I wanna show you. Uh, one was a commercial album by IAL Publications. I'll show you some pages in a minute. So this was to put your stamps in if you so wished, and I bought two of these off eBay. Uh, this album is a personal album of a collector, Jay Heifetz, and his father, the famous violinist, Yasha Heifetz. So with the Ayal uh, album, I have two albums. One has 54 pages and no stamps in it uh, and goes through 1961. The other one has 124 pages going through 1964 uh, with some stamps in it. Uh, so um, there was this one commercial album for IGY. As far as the Heifetz album, uh, I was able to... Um, so these two covers were included in the album. One was addressed to Master J. Heifetz, the son, and one was actually addressed to Yasha Heifetz, uh, the father. And um, I was able, I guess J. Heifetz was a photographer, and uh, I was able to find an email address for him, and he confirmed for me that this was his childhood album. Uh, this video that I won't play uh, shows Yasha Heifetz doing some things at home. He actually, in the 1960s, converted his Renault automobile into an electric vehicle. So that's shown in the video. It also shows him playing ping pong with uh, a, a young gentleman, which I assume is probably his son, uh, Jay, but I don't know that uh, for sure. So this album had 50 pages in it. Uh, a few things had been removed but it was mostly uh, had uh, the stamps and covers inside. Um, finally, this is sort of the end now. Um, uh, what I consider to be the musical anthem of the IGY is a song by Donald Fagan and it's called IGY. So um, let me just play a few seconds of this and hopefully that'll work. Just so uh, it reminds you, I'm sure some of you will recognize the music. I better stop there, it'll take too much time. Uh, but I knew this song for years, but um, I don't think I ever knew that this song, the title of it was IGY. And no place in the lyrics, which I have included on this in the next couple of pages, does actually mention IGY or geophysics or anything like that. But it just, uh, the lyrics kind of reflect uh, an optimism about the future uh, because of the technological developments of the space age. Um, and uh, on the liner notes uh, for the album, um, uh, Donald Fagan wrote that the songs on this album represent certain fantasies that might have been entertained by a young man growing up in the remote suburbs of a Northeastern city during the late fifties and early sixties. Uh, so, um, he was just, he's a couple of years older than, than, uh, than, than me. He must be in his mid seventies. And so I guess he had these uh, memories of uh, living through the IGY when he was 10 years old or so. 
Um, so it's, uh, there are a few other songs that have IGY themes, uh, but uh, this is probably the one most recognizable. So I've split the, if you want to look at this later, I've split the lyrics and the song over these uh, three pages. Uh, so I own several copies of the 45 and the LP and the CD and the musical score of this song as part of my uh, collection. Get not to, to that wheel and spin. So just in conclusion, some uh, reflections about, the, uh, about my collection and, and, and about the, the blog. Um, I have to say that my collecting urge is being satisfied. Uh, it seems like the IGY might be kind of a narrow topic, but there's plenty out there, especially if you complement the stamps and the covers with the books and the music and uh, the articles and the other things that I have in my collection. It's been kind of fun sleuthing everything out. Um, George Carlin and my wife might call this stuff, this stuff or junk, but it's my collection. I've learned a lot about the IGY and I'm continuing to do that as I, I write about the different articles in the IGY bulletins. And I've learned a lot about philately, uh, which uh, a few years ago I, I felt really quite ignorant about. Um, the blog helps, my, helps me with my instinct post-retirement to educate, even though I don't have a very large audience. So anybody that's interested can subscribe to the blog. And whenever a new post comes out, you'll get an email about it. Uh, I've been, become less shy about reaching out to some of the people that I've mentioned today and other people to fill in some of the blanks in my knowledge about all these things. So that's been nice. And uh, even though I've not been that active in the Lancaster Stamp Club, uh, I can see from the work that all of you talk about every month that uh, there's really a common endeavor here. Uh, we all derive pleasure from learning about our stamps and history and how they've in some cases played a role in our lives and, and our desire to share that with each other. So I appreciate your giving me the chance to talk for a little too long about all of this today. Uh, so uh, thanks for your patience and I'm certainly uh, happy to try to answer any questions or open to comments or suggestions you might have about these topics. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, wonderful. Very, very interesting. Uh, kept my attention all the way. So we'll give one of these. <laughs> when I was in college, uh, they used to have what they call a silent here. The cheerleaders would go, give me a silent. Everybody would yell silent and give me a cheer and then go. And that's what I think of when we do this. But uh, really, the heartfelt thank you for this. And I think a really good example of how you can take your, your interests um, and turn them in, into a collecting interest. I mean, when I look back now of all my topicals, uh, I had those interests well before I got into stamp collecting. Uh, kind of as you did too. You you did as a kid for a little bit and had an album, and and so did I. But uh, but but that's about it. And I'm not sure if we went around the room, it'd be a lot of very similar stories. So yeah. thank you. Very good combination of stamps and covers and ephemera, and uh, many of us here love maps and good stories. So we appreciate it. We'll open up to questions. I got a few because uh, uh, I have a bunch of the. Uh, the U.S. stamps. It's one of the first official first day covers I've seen with a logo on it, other than the circle date. Did, has anybody seen any others, or have you, Rob, um, on U.S. stamps? They all have that octagonal uh, IGY logo. Logo, and I think I think it's kind of interesting. I like it. It really makes the, the cover more interesting to me. Yeah, I guess I don't know if other earlier stamps had something like yeah, that. Yeah, I don't know. I can't think of any. Um, and the Van Allen radiation belt, uh, which you showed is up up in the ionosphere. Is that the same thing as the Aurora Borealis? No. So let's see if I can. I think I stopped yeah. the screen. So let's see if I can get back to that. That's also one of my other favorite stamps from, I think, 2007. Those two black ones. Yeah. Okay, now let's see. So... Try this again here. Oops. 
You can see that. Can you see the screen again? Not yet. No. No. Oh, there we go. Is that it? Yep. No. Well, yeah. Um, any of the covers. Yeah. Um, any of the 1958 covers show. Yeah, there you go. Any of these. Yeah. So, so actually, this was. So the Aurora are. This is something that I get very confused on. The Aurora are in the technically the ionosphere, and in fact, I think I used to be con, used to conflate the ionosphere with the Van Allen radiation belts. These are actually much higher up. So the aurora in the ionosphere is about 100 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Uh, these Van Allen belts are about 6,000 and 20,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. So they're actually quite distinct. These two are quite distinct from the ionosphere or anything else here. Was Van Allen the actual discoverer or was he the kind of the producer of the organization? Yeah, so he, he was a physicist at Iowa State. And he, um, he designed the experiment and built the Geiger counters that were sent up uh, with those satellites. And I didn't mention, I have this in my notes, but overlooked it, that it was actually uh, Van Allen's home was in, uh, at least for a while, was in Silver Spring, Maryland, where I also lived when I was younger. And uh, at a meeting at his house in 1950, with some of the other uh, science luminaries of the IGY, like uh, Lloyd Berkner, who I mentioned, and Sidney Chapman, Fred Singer. Um, uh, that's when the idea for the IGY was first hatched, was in this uh, soiree after mm -hmm. dinner at James Van Allen's house. And so it took seven years to put everything to, yeah, together. Yeah, interesting, interesting. And you had a list of uh, like 11 things you wanted to look at. Uh, one of them was seismographs. Would, would that have been the one to study the, the plate tectonics and, and the movements? So, yeah, so this was actually, the IGY was pre-plate tectonics. So plate tectonics as such, as a coherent theory or hypothesis, really sort of crystallized in 1968, I guess, if you were going to give a year to it. So this was a decade before um, plate tectonics, but some of the information collected uh, was useful as those ideas kind of gelled. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I mentioned the, uh, the research station on uh, the, the uh, ice flow in, in the, in the uh, North Polar regions. And uh, one of my blog posts talks about some seismic measurements that was made from that station uh, and they, uh, the, the flow drifted over uh, an oceanic ridge that was in the Arctic, in the Arctic Ocean and underneath the ice. Okay. So uh, that, along with many other oceanographic expeditions during the IGY, helped to map out the bathymetry of the seafloor. And mapping out these ridges that go all through the ocean basins was very important because that's those ridges are places where the uh, ocean floor is rifting apart. And so later, as the ideas of seafloor spreading and uh, plate tectonics really started to develop in the 1960s, um, the information from the IGY was important to support those ideas, but they didn't yet use the word plate tectonics. Continental drift, they'd been talking about, but not yeah, plate yeah, tectonics. Yeah. Very good. I know we've been talking about getting together for a long time. So when we finally do, you can tell me about the plate tectonics. I'll talk to you about the exhibiting. And I think we'll be even. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Very, very good. Very thorough. Other questions, folks? Yeah, I, I have one, uh, if I may. Uh, it's not related to the philatelic content, but with your area of expertise, which is, I believe, the earth magnetic field. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been, uh, I've read several articles uh, probably in the last uh, 10 years or so about the uh, possibility of a polarity switch between the North and South Poles. Mm -hmm. uh, and a number of people feeling that's going to happen, I think probably in this century. Uh, and how much merit do you give to these uh, thoughts? 
That, that's a really good question. So the Earth's magnetic field basically turns upside down, it reverses polarity. Um, on the average, about once every quarter of a million years, but it's a statistical process. So, you know, it doesn't happen every 250,000 years, but if you look long-term on the average, that's about how often it happens. Now we haven't had uh, a magnetic reversal for now about 700,000 years. So you could say we're due. There's a separate, a separate uh, line of uh, studies that looks at the strength of the Earth's magnetic field. And uh, historically, since the time of Gauss, when people have been able to directly measure the strength of the Earth's magnetic field, it's been decreasing in a fairly linear fashion. Uh, and if you look at studies on rocks, and this is some of what I did, from which you can infer uh, what the strength of the magnetic field was at the time, let's say, lava cooled and became rock. That also shows that if you go further back in time, like a few thousand years, that the Earth's magnetic field has been decreasing in strength uh, during that period of time. So one idea of how the magnetic field might reverse is that if it keeps decreasing and gets low enough, that's one of the conditions needed to generate a reversal. So, but the trick is we're extrapolating into the future. You know, if the Earth's magnetic field continued to decrease for another couple of thousand years, maybe we would be having a reversal, but there's nothing to say it actually might not start increasing again. We just don't know that part of it. So there's actually uh, magnetic scientists who have laid down bets for which they won't be uh, alive to uh, know who wins the whiskey, uh, whether we will be having a reversal in the next couple of thousand years or not. Okay, but there's, a, there's a lot of the, the sort of practical aspect of that is, you know, when the Earth's magnetic field is weak, that allows more of these charged particles in the ionosphere or maybe even in the Van Allen belts to penetrate towards the Earth's surface. And this can disrupt communication systems and power grids, damage satellites. Uh, some people have hypothesized they have biological effects, but probably not. So even if we don't go into full reversal mode, in times and places where the Earth's magnetic field is weaker, there are, there are some uh, practical uh, implications of that. Many thanks. I guess I don't need to uh start planning to buy a new compass yet? <laughs> Good question, yeah. So Other the questions for our speaker, folks. Hi, I have something I can share. Um, it's related to one of the fields of study of the IGY. Rob, I enjoyed your presentation. I always admire people who are disciplined enough to really narrow their fields of study <laughs> down to... Um, I mean, I still, I'm getting a little bit better as I get older, but, um, I definitely, uh, um, I'm trying to get too much, but anyway, I'll see if I can share my screen here. And Rob, good. you'll need to un unshare and Scott, you're on to share. Got it. This, um, this is an old patrol flag from oh. my, um, boy scout, um, Boy Scout troop over the weekend on Saturday evening, we had our, we're having our hundredth year of being chartered this year. And we're having, we had an, an anniversary banquet. And this was uh, one of the patrols back in the late fifties, the Sputnik patrol. And I was happy to see this. I remember seeing this hanging in our old troop room um, when I was a scout back in the eighties. <laughs> Very nice. I think Sputnik really got everybody's attention back then. I remember as an eight-year-old, whoa, this is interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. there, there, were, there were lots of amateur. I guess one aspect of the IGY was recruiting amateurs to observe uh, yeah. Yeah. Sputnik and the American satellites as well. So I had some blog posts on some of those, some of those efforts. Uh, yeah, now everybody's doing environmental studies back in our day. We were all doing rocket studies. Yeah, three yeah. or four different kinds of rockets that you could launch, you know, from the water powered, you know, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of fun. Good old days. Jim. Yeah, I like to add that uh, 
when I was in the service, uh, one of the, the big things uh, in the job that I had it came in. They said we just finished for the last couple of years doing a, a survey for that uh, your program and uh, with the radio uh, sunspot activity and on effect on uh, UHF uh, radio communications long distance. Mm -hmm. And this said, you're fortunate because you don't have to fill out all the logs. All you got to do is say, communicate it okay, or or we at a scale of one to 10 of how it was over the night period. So it, it was, the military was well into doing that. And then I, I do know that when sunspot activity is high, UHF, communication that those days was uh, rather poor. <laughs> yeah. And like a full moon? No, no not a full moon. <laughs> I guess when the, the lower layers of the ionosphere expand and get closer to Earth and those, those uh, that plasma in the ionosphere kind of absorbs radio waves. So then it limits how easily radio waves can transmit when solar activity is high. But right. another interesting point that you raise is that the IGY was kind of an interesting mixture of civilian and military operations. And so uh, I think a couple of the items, although I never pointed it out, I think a couple of them uh, mentioned Operation Deep Freeze. So Deep Freeze, the, the Navy actually provided all the sort of infrastructure support for uh, the Antarctic stations, uh, uh, clearing the land and bringing in all the equipment and setting up the huts and the stations. So uh, I guess the military also wanted to, besides, I guess, learning the science better, they wanted to know how to uh, operate in extreme environments and partly thinking, I guess, about global competition, which again now is becoming more important in the North Pole. But uh, the future of Antarctica was a little open and there was still, there was a, a, a thought that there might be lots of resources down there that someday would be exploited and everybody wanted to be in a position to do that if those resources did become exploitable. But the treaties so far have prevented that. I remember going in the Navy and uh, I saw some of the real old timers. They had a, a ribbon that I wasn't familiar with and it was it was like a blue one and it was for the, the, the Antarctic and the polar or uh, you know, the research, you know, the, the deep free stuff like that. And yeah. if they did two tours, they got a little map of uh, Antarctic, you know, put on it. Very, very yeah. interesting. That explains a lot. Yeah, I have I have some deep freeze memorabilia. So it's interesting how the IGY topic, it cross cuts. You know, there are some people that collect on space topics and then some people that collect on uh, mm -hmm. Antarctica. So this interest of mine kind of cross cuts with, with those. Yeah, very, very good. Okay, last chance, folks. Yeah, yes, may I um, ask Rob a question? Um, right now, there's a very strong movement, and I say this very respectfully, of Save the Earth. It seems like that International Geo Geo Geophysical Year would be an excellent foundation for a lot of sub-collections, uh, thinking particularly of Antarctica and the melting of ice at the poles. Um, would this be a correct perception that uh, your presentation tonight could be used for a lot of spin-offs? Yeah, so one could focus on some of the different subtopics. So actually, um, during the IGY was some of the first measurements of atmospheric carbon dioxide, which we now know to be you know, a, a increasing and a driver of climate change. And so uh, there were uh, measurements that were made in Antarctica and also the Mauna Loa Observatory, which was a, is still going today and is the source of some of the most important data about uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you know, started during the, the IGY. So you could argue that uh, kind of a lot of our kind of recent um, thinking on climate change kind of derives from things that happened during the IGY, but also, yes, and other, uh, I, I was reading a few days ago that there was a program that followed the IGY called the International Biological uh, Program. That was in one of my last couple of blogs. 
There's only one stamp anywhere issued for the International Biological Program by Canada. Uh, but during that uh, period of time, it was mostly ecological studies that followed out of some of the biological work that was started during the IGY. And again, sort of, uh, yeah, environment, ecology, uh, global change were important topics in, 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 in that uh, program as well. Rob, you. knowing, uh, you know, geopolitics, uh, you had all these countries, you know, exploring a lot of competition between them. Did they know if all the information was shared with everybody or was that even a requirement? Yeah, so it's a loaded actually, question, but it's it, you no, know. that's a that's a great question because one of the most and I, I don't think I, I don't know if it was mentioned any place. I don't I didn't talk about it. One of the major outcomes of the IGY was they established world data centers, and they still exist today, uh, where all the data was to be uh, <coughs> was to be shared uh, freely amongst all the countries, and. Um, as far as I know, at least, you know, that was done. Uh, and um, uh, there were different, di there are different data centers. In fact, there was, there used to be a World Data Center A, B, and C. Now there's a greater number of them, but one was in the US, one was in, in the Soviet Union. And the third one, I wanna say might've been Belgium, but I'm not, I'm not sure about that. But uh, there was so much data collected. And so uh, archiving it and sharing it was, was very high on the agenda of the IGY, and they succeeded, I think, admirably in doing that. Mm -hmm. So can't say what was not shared, but uh, it seems that it seems like uh, it was done pretty well. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions before we move on to show and tell? Okay, well, good. Another, we'll give you the, those silence shares. Thank you very much, Rob. Really appreciate it. And we'll look forward to your next uh, next installment. And um, I'll, I'll I'll pass out the uh, if I if I can do it your uh, your hand your handout for tonight. And the presentation will also be on the on the website as well. So thank you.